Bibles, if you would, to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus 16. As promised, we're going to preach on the scapegoat today. I appreciate, I have enjoyed studying this. I've noticed sometimes when I study something, I get a lot of joy out of it. It, it hardly ever comes out like it did for me uh, in, the, in the study. So I hope this is different today and hope it does come out uh, to you uh, the way that I hope that you get that. We studied last week on the Day of Atonement. And uh, chapter 23 tells us about that Day of Atonement. But chapter 16 gives us the details of the Day of Atonement, what was to be done on that day. And uh, so we're going to look in chapter 16, if you would, look in verse number 5, and we will read down through verse 14. The Bible says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, that he was the high priest. One uh, and one ram for a burnt offering. Now, now there's two goats that are set aside, and there's a ram that has been killed and is put on the altar of burnt offering. And so that ram is being burned while all this is going on. That's important to note, okay? And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house. And shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, And he shall uh, take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his uh, hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it uh, within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, and that the the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat uh, that is upon uh, the testimony that he die not. He shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the richness of the scripture, the word of God. We pray that you would help us now as we gather together here in the house of the Lord. We pray that you would give us uh, the right words to say, and uh, that this, uh, this teaching, this preaching of the Word of God would affect our hearts. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. And we can, uh, there's a lot of things we can preach practically that uh, gives us things that we can um, uh, serve the Lord in and that we can practice that uh, helps us become uh, closer to God, more in communion with God, uh, then there's times that we preach on what the Lord has done for us. And this is one of those times where we see uh, this great sacrifice that was made for us. We're not, we're not, salvation was free to us, but it certainly was not free. Christ died, gave his life for us. And so because of that, we ought to be a very sincere, dedicated people. Amen? Shouldn't be that they have to beg us to come to church. I mean, it it ought to be something we want to do. We want to be in the house of God. We want to serve the Lord. We want to see other people saved. I mean, it ought to be in our hearts because of what He did for us. Amen? And so we we find in chapter 16 a great truth. 
And as I've <coughs> already said, we find in this uh, section of chapter 16, we find uh, in that that he is detailing what took place on the Day of Atonement. And so we're going to look at that t today with, uh, with some great detail, and I believe that it will be a blessing to you. As we looked at chapter 23, we find that we've already been through the Passover. We've looked at the Passover, and Christ died on the Passover. We looked at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we looked at uh, also on the uh, Feast of First Fruits. He was raised again on the, on the Feast of First Fruits. And then we found the day of Pentecost, um, that Feast of the Pentecost, and that's when the Holy Spirit came down and dwelt in believers, and the church began. And we have that great truth there. Then we find that great parentheses um, that uh, we find, which is the church age. Brother Kelly went through that in his dispensational truths. And, uh, and so we're living in that right now. And what we are awaiting is the rapture of the church. God is going to take us out of here one day. And I'm excited about that. Amen. Then the next thing that comes on the ballot would be a, the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, that is uh, the regathering of Israel, which starts after the church is gone. And it, it culminates at the end of the tribulation period when the, another trumpet will sound and Christ will come back to the earth and uh, as he comes back to the earth. Then we looked at the Day of Atonement last week. And on that Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Jesus Christ will receive the Jewish people, Israel, as they repent and come to him as the Savior. Amen? They are not doing that now, nationally. There are Jewish people that have been saved, but as far as the nation goes, they're still scattered and they're still in blindness. So God one day will gather them back together and has not forgotten his people. And so he will do that. Now, I, I hope we're clear on that coming Day of Atonement. Chapter 16 looks at what took place on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament and pictures what is coming that day when Christ comes back. And so am I clear about that? That's, that's a picture that we get in the Old Testament. And I want to warn you that we can't take types and pictures and use those as the doctrine. What we have to take is the anti-type, which, in other words, the Day of Atonement, all the sacrifices, is the type of Christ dying on the cross. And so what we have in the New Testament is the very anti-type. We have, we have Christ actually dying on the cross. And that's where we get our doctrine. Amen? And so, but these pictures show us clearly that God knew what He was doing all along and uh, gave us little sneak peeks of that. Now, um, as, as we see this Day of Atonement coming, uh, the church is raptured out, the tribulation period has taken place, God has gathered Israel back as His people. The Bible says from the four corners of the earth, the angels will gather them back together and they'll have an opportunity to receive Christ as their Savior. Amen? And I will say this, uh, the Day of Atonement was a great day for them, but Calvary is a greater day. And, and Christ is showing them that Calvary is where they need to look. And so we're, we're seeing that, okay? Now, uh, I'm trying to get my place here. Uh, during the tribulation period, there'll be 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Brother Mike brought out to me the other day that they'll be singing and preaching. And uh, they'll be singing the song of Jehovah. They'll be preaching about the kingdom that is coming and trying to get everyone to look at uh, Christ at His coming. Okay? That's what John the Baptist tried to do. You know, Jesus, and I'll cover this in a minute, but he came for the Jews first. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which, cometh, which taketh away the sins of the world. He was pointing out Christ. And they refused Him. And they rejected him. And because of that, they have been scattered all over the world. But he's going to gather them back up on that day of atonement. Amen? Now, they're going to see him as the Lamb of God uh, when he comes back nationally. Zechariah 13, 6 gives us this great picture. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of of my friends. 
Okay, so they will see that one day. Now, looking back at, at chapter 16, I want to look at, look at some uh, hidden truths that we see here that have been revealed since Christ has come and died on the cross. They should have seen it because they practiced this up until the time that Christ came. Uh, in fact, they were practicing it on the day that he died, was buried, and rose again. And so they should have known that this was the Christ. And, uh, and so we look at that. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 17. The Bible plainly tells us that the Old Testament are shadows of things to come. But the body is of Christ Jesus. And so we, we find these truths that happen actually to Christ Jesus. Amen? So he fulfilled those things. Remember we said, I fulfilled all the law. I fulfilled all things. And so he has done that. Now, I want to look at chapter 16 uh, with a little patience from you. And uh, some of it is a little getting started, but we'll look at this. And I want to look, first of all, point number one, two garments for the high priest. Now, this is a feast that they had. And, and during this feast, the, the high priest had to perform some things. Now, look in uh, chapter 16, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of, his two, of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. You remember the story of, of Aaron's two sons who brought strange fire, offered the wrong way, not the way God said. They did it in the flesh. And because they did it in the flesh, they died. So the Lord is saying, don't do it like those two. And tell Aaron not to do it the way those two did it. There is a specific way that I want it done. Okay? And then he goes on, verse number 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place. He was only allowed to go into the holy of holies one time a year. The day of atonement. Got that? Within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark. And he, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. The ram, I told you, was burning on the altar uh, of burnt offering. It's, it's out right in, at, inside the gate of the tabernacle, the door. That ram is burning on that altar. You need to get that picture in your head. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with the linen girdle and with the linen miter. That's a hat that went on his head. A linen miter shall he be uh, attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. Now, there's two garments that are talked about in this portion of Scripture. The high priest has two sets of garments. Okay? This is important. Number one, he has the white linen. This white linen garment. How many of y'all have ever heard in your life that the high priest was... Uh, not to go behind the veil, um, and, and, if, and they had to tie a rope around his waist, and uh, if they didn't hear the bells ringing, uh, they knew he had died, and they had to pull him back out. That is complete garbage. That is not in the Scripture. He had that garment, but we see in the Scripture right here, he wore a white garment. He took off the glorious garment and put on the white garment. Now that pictures to us that Christ Jesus put off His glorious garments and came to this earth to die for man. What a beautiful picture that is. Did you know that when Christ was, die, was going to the cross, that in a mocking way they took off His clothes and put on a white robe? And that just signified that He is the high priest. He is coming to do that work for you and I. And so he has that beautiful white garment that they put uh, on, and they put that on and spoke of his righteousness. 
The righteousness of God speaks of the righteousness of Christ. Can I tell you that Christ never sinned nor could not have sinned? Had he could, could he have sinned, he would not have been able to be the Savior. And so he was impeccable. Amen. Perfectly sinless. Revelation 19, 8 tells us what those gar- that white garment is. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. <coughs> now we don't have our own righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. Philippians 2, 7 and 8. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so Christ left heaven as the Son of God and came to be the Son of Man so he could die for us. Hebrews seven twenty six: For such an high priest became us. He became man, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Then there's the glorious garment that's talked about in verse 23 and 24. The Bible says, And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle after all the sacrifices have been made of the congregation, shall put off the linen garments which he put on, when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people. Now, I'm going to get to this in just a minute, but this glorious garment was put on after the sacrifice was made. And can I tell you that one day Jesus is coming again? He's going to come back to this earth and he will be wearing that glorious garment. Amen. He will appear as the King of kings and Lord of lords uh, one day upon this earth. And all of Israel will see him in those glorious garments. Now, he's already come in the, in the white linen garment. He's already been made man and died on the cross for us. At, but one day he's coming back in his glory. Amen. Then there's two offerings, and this is where we'll spend most of our time. I wanted you to know about the high priest because we're going to come back to him in just a moment. Now, every day, everyone that was the sons of Levi that were priests, they worked every day. Brother Daniel, they, they took the offerings in. They, they uh, put them on, the, on the, uh, the altar of burnt offering. They worked inside the, the sanctuary with the showbread and the candlestick and the, and the altar of incense. Uh, they weren't allowed to go in the Holy of Holies, but they w- worked in that daily. Uh, they worked at the laver. They worked all, all over the yard. They worked. But this day, the Day of Atonement, it was, Christ, it was the high priest himself. He was the only one. Amen? Many times in the Bible, the Bible says Christ himself. Amen? So he was the only one. Now, let's look at the two offerings. Look in Leviticus again, chapter 16, verse 5. And she, he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord, At the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one uh, for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So we see here a picture of two different types of offerings, okay? One came before the other, but I'm going to reverse this and kind of show you what takes place. Aaron was to take two goats, all right? These goats were for a specific purpose. And I want you to notice something that I had never noticed before until I studied this again. He takes these two goats, but he doesn't use them immediately. 
They're just set aside. If you read it, he makes the offering of the bullock for himself and for his house first. Then he comes back to the two goats. Okay? So I, here's what we're going to look at. Those two goats, one was for the Lord and was slaughtered in front of everybody. They saw that goat die. Then he took the blood of that goat and took it behind the veil and offered it, the blood, to the Lord. The other goat, he laid his hands on his head, transferred the sin of all the people, and that goat was taken into a land uninhibited, out into the wilderness, and it died all alone. No one saw it die. They just saw it go away. Okay? So, we're going to, look, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But right now, I want to take you to the bullock. Look in verse 6. The Aaron said, And Aaron shall offer his bullock the, uh, of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. I wondered why uh, he waited on the two goats. I wondered about that. I wonder why they were set aside and then he went back for the bullock. And I, and I got to thinking about this. Those were for Israel, those two goats. They were for Israel. Christ came to Israel for Israel first. You say, I don't believe that. Matthew chapter 10, verse, uh, verse number 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to Israel first. Amen? Now, did Israel receive him? No, they did not. Is God through with Israel? They're put on hold. He's waiting. They have been set aside for another time. Does that make sense? He set these two goats aside. And there's a waiting period before he uses them. Okay? And, and that just came to me while I was studying that. Now, this proves that Israel's not the church. It's separate. Amen? Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now, if those are all the same thing, why did he separate them? They're not. We are not Israel. We're not spiritual Israel. We are the church. And so, we see a picture of him offering the bullock, and that includes us. Amen? He offered the bullock first. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, to make an atonement for himself, and listen to this, and for his house. You say, what does that mean? Hebrews 3, 6 tells us what that means. But Christ, as a son over his own house, and whose house we are. He said, Christ's house is the church. He lives in us. Amen? And we are the house of the Lord. And so when he offered that bullet, that included us. Amen? He offered that blood. Now I'm going to give you the details of that offering. Number one was the sacrifice. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Now, he kills this bullock, but he does not put it on the altar of burnt offering. There's already a ram burning on that altar. Okay? So this bullock is the sin offering. What happens with the sin offering is the blood is brought before the Lord. Okay? That, that animal dies and its blood is brought before the Lord. Now, there's a censer. I, I thought this was so good. There's a censer there. Leviticus 16, 12, and 13. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, 
and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense of fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I told Pastor this morning, I've been preaching this wrong. I, I, I saw this and I thought, my goodness, I have been preaching this long, wrong. How many of you know how many pieces of furniture is in the sanctuary before you go into the Holy of Holies? How many pieces? How many pieces, Brother Mike? Three. What are they? The altar of incense, the lamp stand, and the table of showbread. That's right inside the sanctuary. The lamp stand's here, the table of showbread's here, altar of incense sits right before the veil. And that burned continually, day and night. And what would happen is they kept incense on that and that smoke that would come off of that would go up under the veil and into the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat. Okay, and that happened every day except for one, the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, I'm fixing to prove to you that that altar of incense wasn't even in there. It wasn't even in there. And I'll show you something. Amen. Look in Hebrews chapter 9. You'll want to turn there. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1. <laughs> Hebrews and Leviticus are twins. There, there's much truth found in Hebrews that was found in Leviticus. You there, amen? Look at verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, means earthly. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. How many pieces? Two. Only two. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. Now, how many pieces of furniture are supposed to be in the, in the Holy of Holies? One. But what does it say here? Two. There's a, a golden censer in there, and there is the Ark of the Covenant. You, are you getting chill bumps yet? And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein the golden pot... Uh, that had manna and Aaron's rod had budded in the tables of the covenant, which is the law, and over it the cherubims of glory, uh, shadowing the mercy seat of which cannot now speak particularly. Now, here's a picture in Hebrews of what took place one day a year. And that was the Day of Atonement. The furniture has changed. Things have been rearranged for that day. And I'm going to explain why. Every day of the year, the golden altar of incense was there, but now it's not. Every day of the year in the Holy of Holies, there was one piece of furniture, but now there's two. And that is on the Day of Atonement. Now, first, here's what takes place. He takes the censer to the altar of burnt offering where the ram is being burnt. Okay, the high priest does this in his white linen. And he takes hot coals off of that altar. And he puts them in that censer. I'm sure with tongs, he didn't do it with his hands. But he takes coals, hot coals, and puts them in that censer. Now you all know what a censer is, just a pot. On, usually on a rope or chains. I'd say for the tabernacle it was made nice and so it was probably on chains. But he would take it out there, put hot coals in it, okay? And, uh, and then on his way back in, he would take sweet incense. Incense. Now, this is not pothead incense on a stick. This is a, this is a secret recipe. It's found in the book of Exodus, okay? God told them how to make it. 
and an apothecary, I can't ever say that word, a, a, a pharmacist, a, a Levitical pharmacist. He put it together, okay? This was an incense, a sweet incense. The recipe was given to him, and guess what? Anything the Lord does is perfect. And so this was a perfect recipe. Every time they made it, it was perfect. Amen? And it smelled sweet. And, and, and so he put this thing together. And it pictures that the Lord had many aspects to his life, but all of it was perfect. All of it was put together for God. The Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, Brother Tony, it was appointed for Christ to come and die for the world. And he was that God-man, that perfect man. But he took, you say, how did he do that? How did, how did he have a censer in his hand and have both hands full of incense? Well, it was a liquid. It was a liquid. How do I know that? They anointed the priest, the high priest with it before he ever started all this. And the Bible says it dripped off of his beard. Okay? Picture this. When the high priest came to do the offering, you could see him coming. You could also smell him coming. You could hear him coming. And I want to tell you, Christ is coming. And don't he look sweeter and smell sweeter? And This speaks of the fragrance of the Lord. He didn't smell like a man. He smelled like this mixture that God had put together. Boy, that just thrills my soul. And so he dipped his hands and got both hands full of that. And then he picked, he has the censer in the other hand. And he's coming, amen. He got everything he could grab. <laughs> everything his hands could grasp, he took with him. And that's what Christ did for us. Amen. Everything his hands could grasp. The fragrance of God. The high priest is coming to make the sacrifice. Then he takes the censer and the hands full of incense into the Holy of Holies. He goes behind that veil where no one could go but one time a year. Now you see why Hebrews says there's a censer in there. Because the high priest took it in there. Amen. He takes it in there. And inside of that Holy of Holies, there is the, the Ark of the Covenant. On the top of that Ark of the Covenant is a mercy seat. It is one piece of gold beaten into this marvelous, marvelous, marvelous picture. Gold seat, pure gold. Two cherubim on top with their wings touching over the middle. And they're looking down. What are they looking down for? The Bible says in the, in the New Testament, angels long to look into these things. They don't understand why God could be merciful to a people like us. But He is. Amen? You know those angels showed up in person when Christ died? They looked into the tomb. There was an angel sitting on each end of where He sat. Amen? So we see that golden seat. And then he sprinkles the incense. <laughs> he sprinkles his hands are full of incense, Brother Daniel. And there's a, there's a center there with hot coals in it. And he drops that incense into those hot coals. Guess what happens? <laughs> Smoke engulfs him and the mercy seat. And he smells with the fragrance of God, the high priest. Whew. What a blessing. Amen. So we see that incense taken in there. We see that smoke filling the Holy of Holies. And then he does something really neat. He takes his finger and he dips it in the blood of that bullock. Now, he sprinkles it on the mercy seat. How many times? Once. One time. He says he sprinkles it on the mercy seat eastward. One time. 
Then he sprinkles it before the mercy seat seven times. What is before the mercy seat? The ground. He sprinkles it on the ground seven times. I've been preaching that wrong. One time on the altar, Christ died one time, shed his blood one time, and offered it up for us one time, once for all. Then he sprinkles it seven times before the mercy seat. Amen. For the picture it shows. Amen. You know what that seven times on the ground speaks of? That he has fulfilled the law, and now we have a standing with God, which is perfect. What do you do before the mercy seat? He stood there. And where he stood, he sprinkled that seven times. It's in there. You can read it. Amen? But it also left a mark. It left a mark in that sand. Maybe the next day, Brother Daniel, God sent the, the, the pillar of cloud and they moved that tabernacle. Guess what stayed? The testimony that God had done something in that spot. And when I got saved, I now have a standing with God and a testimony that my life has changed. Things are different now. There's been a mark put on me that will never change. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things will pass away. Behold, all things become new. What a beautiful picture we have here. God has been in my life. Listen to this, Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Let me give you a blessing. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. I want to show you something. The high priest that offered one time every year could not be a forerunner. A forerunner means he went in, now everybody else can go in. Brother Mike, that high priest could not, could not let anyone else into the Holy of Holies, only him one time a year. Watch this. Hebrews 6, 20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made an high priest over the, uh, forever after the order of Melchizedek. That Levitical priest could not do that, but Jesus as our high priest went in once. Now we can enter boldly into the Holy of Holies and into the presence of God. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what the Lord has done for us? Now, let's go back to the two goats. Amen? We'll be through. One is for the Lord, the other is for the scapegoat. Leviticus 16, 5, and He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Verses 15 through 24 tells us some things. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring the, his blood within the veil and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle upon the mercy seat once and before the mercy seat seven times. All right? And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth uh, among uh, them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement of the holy place until he come out and uh, have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. For himself and for the household was for us, the bullock. For the congregation of Israel is this goat that he killed. Okay? He takes that in, does the same offering the way that he did the bullock. 
And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord, and shall make an atonement, and shall take the blood of the bullock, and of the, of the blood of the goat, and, and put it to, upon the horns of the altar round about. Now, Brother Mike, he's taking the blood, and he's mixing it. It's the blood of the goat and the blood of the bullock. You know what that means? He died for the whole world. He died for us. He died for Israel. Amen? It's a whosoever will. Those four horns that are on the altar, Brother Tony, was east, west, north, and south. One preacher said, north, east, west, and south. That means news. There's good news. It's a whosoever. Did you know it was five cubits on each side? Did you know it faced every direction? Whosoever will, come unto me. Amen. I done lost my place. And he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of congregation and the altar he shall bring the live goat. Verse 23, or 21. And Aaron shall lay hold, uh, shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of all the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send them away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhibited. And he shall let the goat go, uh, he shall let go the, the goat in the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. He shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments, that's his glorious garments, and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people uh, and make an atonement for himself and for the people. Now here's what happens. He kills the goat that is the Lord's. And he offers him and he sprinkles it on the horns of the altar along with the bullock and also in the holy of holies just like it was done with the bullock, and this was for the people. They saw this take place. They saw Aaron do this, okay? Did we see the Lord? We, we, did, we weren't there, but many witnesses saw the Lord die on the cross. Is that all there was to the Lord dying on the cross? No. Now listen. He lays both hands. Brother Mike, when you as an Israelite came with an offering to the Lord, you brought him to the door of the tabernacle and you laid one hand on his head. One. And that was transferring your sin, your family's sin. But the high priest on the Day of Atonement laid those two hands that had been dipped in that sweet-smelling savor on his head. And that means a whosoever will. The whole world. Amen. He died for the whole world. He laid them on the hands of that goat. Okay. Now that goat was not sprinkled with blood. That sprinkling was inside the Holy of Holies. That goat had his, the sin transferred onto him. Then what was called a fit man would run him out into the wilderness and he would die somewhere out in that wilderness where no one could see it. We see the first goat die which pictures the public execution of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. Then we see the other goat go off into the wilderness and die unseen. This shows us how Jesus died in relation with the Father. That was between him and the Father. The Bible says it pleased him, it pleased God to bruise him. Psalm 22 gives us a look into that private conversation between my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was talking to the Father. The Father put Christ to death so that we could live. That's called grace. That goat went off into the wilderness by the grace of God. 
and died before the Father. What a picture. And when all this was done, and that fit man came back from the wilderness, that high priest <laughs> would put back on his glorious garments and appear before all the congregation of Israel. There's a scripture, when Jesus died, what did he say? It is finished. The atonement has been made. When that fit man came back, that high priest put on his glorious garments. It doesn't say anywhere in Scripture, Brother Tony, that he said it is finished. But they knew it was finished. For that year, it was finished. When Christ comes back for Israel, he'll come back in his glorious garments and tell them it is finished. The atonement has already been made. All that we're lacking is for you to repent and come to me. Can I tell you a little secret here today? Christ's death has already been done for us. It's already been, the, the, the salvation has already been purchased by Jesus Christ. He took our place on the cross. The only thing that's left is for you to repent and come and receive His Son as your Savior. But preacher, I don't understand all that. You don't have to. You just have to believe it. There's no way this Bible could be put together over 1,500 years and all come out the same. But it does. And it all points to Christ and what He's done. And not just for us, but for Israel and for the whole world. Amen? Amen. Romans 3 ties this all together, if you'll look with me and we'll be through. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God, being justified freely. That word freely, I looked it up, means without a cause. Nothing righteous about you. He didn't die because you were, wor you were anything worth it. I wasn't worth it. You are not worth it. By His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, mercy seat, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Did you know you don't have to go to hell today? You can be saved. Why? God forbear your judgment and put it on His Son. And if you'll come and trust Christ today, you can be saved. And you can stand as a testimony saying, God has marked me and set me aside that I'll never have to be judged beyond this point. What a blessing. I, I hope that came out clear, but that scapegoat is a blessing to me. And it ought to be a blessing to you that Christ was our scapegoat. He took away our sins so that we could live. He died, was buried and rose again so that we could live. He put his blood on the mercy seat for you and I so that we could live. Wonder why we don't live for him. I've, won, I've looked at my life at times where I've slacked and not lived for Christ like I should have. Not, and and I, it grieves me that he would do so much for me. And yet I want to live like I don't even, like I'm not even bought with a price. The great price paid for you and me. The blood of a human being and, and all God was for you and me. If you're not saved here today, would you come this morning, get that settled. Somebody take the Bible, show you how to do that. Or if you are saved and not dedicated, would you say enough is enough? Repent. Come to the Lord and say, I'm sorry. Plead. Plead what he says in, in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you come today and say, Lord, I want to live for you. I'm so glad about what you've done for me.
I want to live for you. I want to see others saved. Come to know you. How about you? I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. If you need to.